what I want to talk about now is uh, two two sessions which uh, will run now into each other. They're going to be split, but. Firstly, working with the NHS, um, it starts really from the point of view of um, when we started as a new committee, uh, we thought it was pretty important that we had a good look at what we were going to do. So we looked at what had happened in the past and we had the website, well that was fairly easy to decide we were going to go forward with that because Vim was able to do it, it was there, it was in situ. Uh, and it wasn't particularly uh, time consuming or expensive. So the website was a bit of a no-brainer. The free telephone line, it was a condition of me taking the chair that, to, that Kath would continue with that, because that to me is the most important service that we get. That's for people who, out of the blue, need some help and need to talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about. So Kath handles that and that uh, continues. Maintaining the database, if we don't have a means of communicating with you people, then we've got real trouble. So we have to have an up-to-date database. We, have, we, we do still try and keep in touch with people that are not on computers, but fortunately now most people are. And those who tend to be the older generation who are not on computers at least are in touch with people that are. So it's making life an awful lot easier. Uh, so basically that function for us to to John, uh, and as you'll find as you get to know John, that means Helen does it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I take the credit. <laughs> <laughs> then the conference. We, we looked at the, the fact that there was, there had been conferences. Uh, we felt they were important, uh, but they're also quite costly to organise. Um, we took a decision this time that we would have the technical presentations the medical presentations videoed um, so that we could put those online and that would give us an option going forward as to whether we actually run full conferences again. There are essentially two functions of the conference. One is so that you can meet other people with a condition uh, and the other one is so that you can pick up the latest information from our expert Elizabeth. Um, we think it may be that going forward we'll take a view that we will have organised meetings on a timely basis around the country, uh, you know, maybe one in London, one in Glasgow, whatever, in future to get groups of people together, uh, which will be much more convenient for people not to travel so far and much more, um, much less costly uh, to, for, for individuals and for the group. Two items that did happen before, uh, which have really to all intents and purpose ceased, are the newsletter. The situation with the newsletter was that over time, uh, Carol had struggled to get contributions from people, so that it was becoming, while well, she put loads of effort in, it was becoming more and more like uh, Carol's close, closest family reports and very few additional items. And it, it's, it was quite an expensive thing to do through the post uh, and it was very time consuming so given that we had scarce resources we decided that that would cease. Uh, fundraising we put to one side and we put to one side because we had uh, some money in the bank we had about when, when I took over about six and a half to seven thousand pounds and we knew that that would cover the costs going forward for a short time and therefore uh, I felt that First of all, there'd been a lack of enthusiasm for fundraising when uh, when Carol had tried to to motivate, and it seemed to me that that wasn't the highest priority. If we need to do that, if we decide that we want we have objectives that require us raising money, then we'll, we'll slip into action and we will do that. But then we sat back and said, well. We now need to think about whether that's all the committee should do, so we had a bit of a brainstorming uh, event and our conclusions were that this is very much I, an overall situation but we've, we felt that generally, locally, the kidneys and the eyes were dealt with pretty well by the, the NHS as it stands at the moment. As long as you get referred and as long as you... Uh, as you uh, have the regular checkups, 
they seem to be pretty well looked after. But there were, there were three issues listed there which we felt were not being attended to. And they are diagnosis. Now, if you think about diagnosis, when, it, when you actually need to diagnose a condition, it's not that difficult. I mean, you know, Elizabeth takes hold of your hands, looks in your eyes and says, uh, you've got no patella syndrome. She can tell from your fingernails and very little else. So it's not a difficult diagnosis. The problem is that until you know to go see somebody that knows what they're looking for, you don't know about it. So particularly in, the, in families, of course, where you've got it, you know to expect it. But spontaneous cases, that's not the case. We wrapped our brains on this and the solution that we came up with was firstly that we try and get circular sent to every doctor's practice. That uh, we found wasn't going to happen, so the next step was to work through the NHS Choices website and I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, so we felt diagnosis was something that deserved our attention. Counselling. Um, People had talked about counselling, but when they talked about counselling to us, they talked about it in the context of almost as if something was wrong, so they had counselling. And that's not what counselling is. Counselling is education. Counselling is like what you would do in a corporate organisation where you would train your staff. It's making sure that your, 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 your uh, people are able to uh, understand what is available to them. So. We, we needed to be sure that counselling was available and that people understood what counselling was and would access it. So, again, we've done that through the NHS uh, Choices website and you will see, uh, hopefully at the end of this, we'll go onto the website and look at how you pick these things out. But the basic idea there is that you can talk to your doctor and say, look, the NHS's own website contain a section on nail patella syndrome and in there it talks about count genetic counselling as a service that's offered and we would like to take advantage of that and the timing of that is important Elizabeth talked about that earlier so uh, I don't really want to give any indications to when it, when it should be um, you need to consider that as individuals and as parents um, and then finally at every conference that we, I'd been to, um, and certainly Kath felt the same from her experience, everybody has said the situation, as far as surgery is concerned, is unacceptable. Uh, all the things that were said previously about uh, um, the surgeons doing it for the first time, not knowing what's going on. So we felt we ought to at least address the question of surgery and see if there was a solution. So first of all, the Choices website, we are there. If you, if, you, if you Google NHS Choices, you'll get onto the website and there you will see references to, when I say diagnosis, if you type, if you type nail into the NHS Choices website, one of the conditions that it will draw your attention to is nail patella syndrome. So if a medical practitioner wants to, they can look at that, they will click on that and they can say, you know, it will direct them towards that possible cause. I don't know how we can take that any further, but we have got, we have got that done. Genetic counselling, we have a specific link in there. All you do is click on it and it, will te it tells you that in every single area health authority in the country, genetic counselling is available. The symptoms of the condition are listed there. Some of the ways it describes them I think could be better, but I'm perfectly happy. It does cover them pretty well. It talks about the kidney problem. It talks about glaucoma. It even covers the, the problems of taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs so it really is quite comprehensive uh, and, and now instead of having to go see the doctor and say have a look at the NHS uh, have a look at, at uh, Nail Patella Syndrome website you can say have a look at your own website and you have a, you have a, a way of discussing the subject with him. The last item there pre-implementation pre genetic diagnosis there is a link on the website 
uh, if anybody wants to, uh, on the NHS Choices website, again, you can ask them to cover that. Um, so, 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 in that way, we left ourselves with one remaining task, and that was to deal with the surgery aspect. So, with regard to surgery, the, ex the, the comments that have been made were that, generally, it was the surgeon's first situation that they, they would have come across a joint laid out in the way that it was. Often the surgeon had no idea what he'd found when he went in. MRI scans were not often used. In fact, when Claire had her operation on her knee by a guy who I think the world of was magnificent, but he actually said, when we were paying for that operation, he actually said, look, I'm confident I can do that without the MRI scan. And we took a decision that that was okay at the time. Fortunately, it's been great. But, really, MRI scans, I'm told now, should be, should be taken so that the surgeons don't get any surprises. Standard replacement joints may not fit. One of the issues that, was, that uh, occurred with Carol with her elbows was that when they got in there, they found that the joints were so small that the, the normal implants, there, was a, there wasn't enough bone left to be able to get the, the, the metal pieces in. So therefore they had to re-engineer the, the, uh, uh, the implant. Many procedures have to be revisited. When you talk to people with the condition, the number of times you say, well, I've had this done X times, I've had this done Y times, we really need to try and find a way of not having to revisit. Uh, there is in, the, uh, from my own experience, I've had nothing to do with Nepotella syndrome, but I've had uh, arthroscopies on two ankles. I've had one ankle fuse, which is effectively screwed together, and my other ankle is an artificial ankle. So I have a reasonable amount of experience of talking to consultants about the risks of surgery. And the one that they talk about over and over again is infection risk. And if you can avoid that infection risk, then you're going to get magnificently improved outcomes. So that was something, and, and if, you can have, if you can have operations done, which uh, my brain's gone dead, rather than opening up the joint uh, keyhole, keyhole yeah. surgery, then because you're not exposing it for a length of time, there's less risk of, of an infection. Now, the last point there, we had to take into account because this actually affects the way that we had to consider it. It's a consultant who decides what he's going to specialise on in his career. It's not like in other areas of in, in businesses where in a, in a business you would normally say, well, we need somebody to do this, so you train somebody to do that. Medicine works differently. Consultants decide what fields they want to specialise in. Now, if you think about it, if you are a young man that spent his life getting to a very high standard and you're 25, 26 years old, you're going to specialise, you're not going to specialise in a rare condition, are you? Your market share is so small that you're just not going to do it. So we had to try and find a way of exercising some sort of influence to try and get the right surgeons to take notice of nail patella syndrome. So that was our objective. So we started off and looked at it and said, well, we're actually slightly different to a lot of parts of the world. Let's look at the pluses here. We're in the UK and we have the NHS. And, and incidentally, Europe has a very sort of, for people from other parts of Europe, they have a very similar approach to the UK. They treat, they, they do in principle want to give healthcare free at the point uh, and based on need. It's the only budget in Britain which has been protected and promised growth by all the parties in the UK. If you compare that to, for example, America, where at the moment they're in lockdown because of an argument about their uh, healthcare budget, so we are lucky and we felt as though we were pushing against an open door. So we made a conscious decision that we weren't going to moan about the NHS, we weren't going to try and make life difficult, we were going to try and work with them and we set about doing so. 
we talked to various genetic groups and we basically said, could you recommend a surgeon? Because lots of them did have paths available. Unfortunately found that whilst they tried, they couldn't find a surgeon that would say, yes, I'll do it. So loads of goodwill, but no action. And so we then decided we needed to move quickly. So I decided to speak to my MP. Now he's a guy called Philip Davis. Um, when I went to see him, I first of all wrote a long letter explaining the situation which he'd had before I, before I got there. When I went into the room, I found out he hadn't opened it. That's the only criticism I've of the guy, because he opened it there, we talked about things, and the thing that amazed me was that I didn't have to sell the case to him. He understood exactly the problem and he multiplied it. And one of the things he said to me is that he'd been involved in the situation in Leeds where they just decided to reduce the number of children's heart units across the country. And one of the reasons that they'd done that was because the experience that the surgeons were getting of operating on children's heart conditions, couldn't be, they couldn't have the workload which kept their level of training at the right level, and that was a key factor in the motivation to close it. It wasn't because of cost of a unit in a place, it, it was that. And he said to me, how on earth can we have that situation, and yet when people go for an operation on MPS, they have not, you know, the, the, the guy doing the job never seen it before. It just wouldn't be accepted in any way. So he absolutely accepted from point one that there was a necessity to do something, and it was pretty easy to go forward. From there, he put us through to Andrew Lansley, and he got sacked two weeks later. So... I thought we may get lost in the pot, but it then went to a chap called Earl Howe, who is responsible for quality in the Commons. So we got a response from him, and the first thing that happened was he sent us, he said to me, uh, the, the European consultation on rare diseases, and asked me to fill it in. So I thought, well, I've been stitched up like a kipper here, haven't I? I thought, it's the old classic, if, if, if somebody wants something, you just give them a job. You know, make it a big job, and they'll get fed up of it. And this thing was a big job. I mean, it was like three times the length of any book that I'd ever take on holiday. It covered mountains of work. But it was well down the line. They hadn't just started. It was patently clear that there'd been a lot of submissions already, and it contained a lot of conclusions. So it was directing comment. And the conclusions agreed with pretty well everything that the committee had discussed and felt were appropriate. So it was saying, for example, that most rare diseases are genetic, that they often share similar characteristics, that the surgery is complex, that the surgeons need to build up experience, that they have to have a workload that enables them to do that, and that that could only be achieved through specialist centres. So they had already come to the conclusion that they needed specialist centres. At that stage, and once you have the specialist centres, it would be possible to do research. Now, we talk about research within MPS, but really, we're talking here largely about assessing, adding up the conditions that each of us have experienced, not, not pure research. But if you get a lot of genetic conditions with similar circumstances, pure research could apply and you would have experts in those centres. So first of all, it was, it was very reassuring to find that we were, we were planning and wanting to do the same thing that Europe had decided needed to be done. And this is a European directive. This is not just the UK. Every country in Europe is having to go through this process at the moment. Now, let's just look at the implications of some of those conclusions. There are not going to be lots of centres to deal with MPS, are there? There aren't enough people with MPS to have lots of centres. So, you know, we, we're not going to be able to have an MPS centre in Manchester and one in Glasgow and one in London. So, there's a trade-off here. I understand the difficulty that there is for people to travel to see doctors and consultants, the costs involved and so on. But I guess from where I'm looking at the moment is unless we get a centre up and running and effective, we can't go to the next step. So uh, 
the separate countries in the UK are all absolutely committed to this, so my suspicion is that it will probably start off as one and it might move to two. There are going to be logistics problems, and I'm, not, and, and I'm afraid we don't have a solution for those logistics problems, but then you have to be in a situation where, well, is it better to have a successful solution to your surgery than to have a local solution, a cheap solution, whatever, you, what have you. So that's the sort of logic going through our minds. There is no other way of getting this, this problem sorted out. This is, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only solution available. And so it seemed to us that common sense had won through. We submitted our comments on the consultation process but then, okay, we put the you know, typically it could take 10 years before anything happens with a, a European directive. So, again, we had a discussion and said, well, what can we do? Where can we take it forward from here? So, we basically said, as it says, uh, when I was going through it more slowly, I was called the Freddie Mercury concept. I want it all, but I want it now. So, we, we had to find a way of exerting influence. The fact that we'd done the, the submissions and that we'd had quite a lot of discussions during the process of submissions meant we made quite a lot of contacts in the NHS, particularly in the administrative side of the NHS. So basically we became a pest and went back to them uh, until we managed to convince them that they would introduce us to somebody, we wanted somebody at an appropriate level in the NHS. We actually were offered a meeting with Professor Tim Briggs. Now, Kath and I went down to London and met Professor Briggs at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore, which for those who don't know, it's about five minutes off the M1 near Watford. It's less than half an hour from, well, it's about half an hour from the middle of London on the Chew. But it's reputed to be one of the top five hospitals in the world. Professor Briggs is himself a world-renowned surgeon. He's very, very highly involved in organising the NHS and arranging for the, the structures in the NHS. And he is a world-renowned surgeon. I have to say that I, I hadn't appreciated, before I went down there, the man we were going to meet. It was very comfortable. It was a very comfortable meeting. Again, like with the MP, there was absolutely no need to persuade anybody of anything. It was almost as if as we started to talk to him and got half the sentence out, he finished the sentence for us and explained what was needed. There was a pretty well total meeting of minds and he, he talked about the fact that they deal with a lot of genetic conditions. Now at this stage, we, there has to be a first. We're not going to find an existing MPS unit. There has to be a start and there has to be a build up. It seems appropriate, we've discussed this since with Elizabeth, that if that unit deals with lots of other genetic conditions, the likelihood is that that would be the right place. So again, we were reassured that this is the right road to go down. He then talked to us about getting it right first time. And this may sound like well, it's obvious, but he'd written a book on it, and he gave us the book there and then. And he talked about the things like infection control. The infection rate in the specialised hospitals is half, it's less than half, the rate in the general NHS. Now, where you've got complex joints and you have to revisit, believe me, that in itself is a good enough reason to consider that, to consider seriously using the specialist units. And finally, he agreed to accept referrals from NPS patients from NHS patients on sorry, NPS patients on the NHS. Now that is in my opinion a mind blowing breakthrough and an opportunity for us to move the surgery process into something which will have massively improved outcomes. 
We issued a newsletter to members and told them of the new arrangements. Now, please understand that from this stage onwards, patient confidentiality starts to come into play. I can't ask Professor Briggs to tell me whether he's seen three MPS patients. He's not allowed to tell me. So the only feedback that I can get is from you. Um, I understand that uh, we've had a, a number of people, two or three people have seen him, and I think there are more people, the last communication I had was that, the, that he was seeing a couple now. So I can, I can do little more than re the act now based on what you ask me to do. So if you, if you say to me, I've tried to get a, a referral, but I can't get a referral, I can deal with that, but, I, but obviously it can't work through him. I am aware that there have been one or two problems, and I'd like to just discuss those. The typical situation within the NHS is because it's run on a regional basis, is that when you go to see your doctor, he will try to refer you within the service providers within the area. They don't, they, they control, I think it's something to do with controlling the budget in that way. I think now, we could probably, if, if, if a doctor were to say that he didn't want to refer to Professor Briggs because of that situation, I think we could probably draft a letter that might help them to change their mind on that, just by drawing attention to the fact that it has been recommended to us at the highest level of, of, of the NHS. But basically, until you come to me and tell me, I can't do anything about it. Can I just say, bro? Yeah? I went to get a referral to Tim Briggs myself for my back. And um, my, my doctor sent the referral. I got a letter back to around saying he wouldn't accept me. I don't think it was in person. He went for a screening process. Because I hadn't had treatment at a primary uh, below hospital first. There weren't x rays in those. And what was that So it was a specialist tier three hospital. Because I hadn't had x rays. I'd been seen by my local hospital. They would turn me down on that. On that basis. They would turn you down or they did turn you down? No, uh, they did turn me down. Yeah. So the people that you asked were? Were, it was the Royal National, got a letter back from the Royal National. So you wrote to the Royal National? National. Right. And they sent me, <coughs> they, they, I asked to go see Tim Briggs. Yeah. And they assessed it and sent me to some other doctors. Right, I could understand it being a member of his team. This this guy is, yeah. is, is, a, is, a, is a such a high level, I, I would expect that you would see one of his... Yeah, uh, I understand, but he said specifically, because I didn't have imaging, because my doctor hasn't sent over imaging that hasn't been provided by a, a secondary care hospital, by a local hospital, Right. because I haven't seen an orthopedic right. at a local hospital first, so I've turned down that basis. That is standard, I've had that as well. Well, in that case, what I think we, what we need to do is to write to Professor Tim Briggs and say, we're having this issue, would, what do we do about it? Because doctors have said to me, unless you exhaust your local hospitals first, you can't go straight to a special. Can't go straight. Now, to but that's a different to what, uh, if I understand it correctly, that's different to what you're saying. I think you're saying you actually I, I, wrote I to Professor Tim Briggs. I asked to go see him, and I've got a letter back to him and say because I haven't had imaging done, and I haven't seen all the people doctor at my local hospital. Right. They turned me down that basis. Okay. Well, we, this is where we're going to have to find out things. This is where this is where we have to go forward to the, to the next route. I would suggest that if you were referred to a local, a local surgeon, the best route to do, to go, is to see the local surgeon and say, I have Neopatella Syndrome, I'm a, I know from Neopatella Syndrome UK that, that they now have a professor at Stanmore who's accepting patients because we need this specialised centre and see if he will take it. You've got to be very careful. I, I, yeah, you must be very, very careful how you speak to doctors. If you start telling the doctor that, that you want X, yeah. immediately saddles go up and he immediately thinks he ain't getting X. So it needs to be a request and it needs to be done politely. But I, I think it ought not to be, you know, having done all this way, it ought not to be beyond the wit of us to end up with patients in front of the doctor who said that he's prepared to see them. So we have to find a way of doing that now. And if you 
have come across a specific issue, write, write to me. I have sent emails out asking for people, have you had any problems? I've had one single reply. So I can only assume if I don't get a reply that nobody has a problem. So if somebody... Some people have successfully gone to see him, haven't they? I believe so, yeah. I know, I'm just looking on Facebook, Jackie has been on there, she's... Put in July, I think, and said that that's gone well. Um, and Laura's mentioned it as well, so I, I don't know what's happening that's different between systems, but I hope you know it's working somewhere. It's just finding out and getting that consistency. Thanks for that. I am aware of the fact that one person has paid to see him, that would that might. Uh, I'm, I'm keen to make sure that people can see him without having to pay. Um, so, but, but fine. We, all I'm saying is, if you have, if you try and you fail, speak to me. I'll, if I can do something, I'll try and help. And that that has to be the route forward. As it says at the bottom of that slide, email me on all the messages that I send out. I always put an email address to reply. Email that address. Please don't put a note on Facebook. It's as a as a general matter of procedure. We cannot talk about medical issues in the public domain. I cannot get involved in talking about anything that is medical, so an individual's medical situation in the public domain. It's just not something that. Get all your details while we're here. I've never received an email. Um, it's been on the website. It's been referred to on the Facebook site with a link to to the, the email, and I've sent. Are you on the mailing list? Never received. You're not on the mailing list. Right. Well, if you if you give John your and he'll he'll send all the, send that to you. <coughs> so in summary, there was nothing. There now is something, and it possibly is pretty close to the best that's available in the world. It lies in our hands now. We it's up to us to make it work. If we want better surgical outcomes for, chil for our children, I think this deserves a fair amount of effort. Um, so that ends the official presentation. Should we be going to see him then instead Sorry? of should we be going to see him instead of going to our own hospitals? When it comes to surgical matters, yes. In my opinion. I mean I can't tell you what to do. Your 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 health care is a matter for you. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye -bye. If, if you, you know, I, I, I can't tell anybody that they ought to follow a procedure. What I can tell you is that we now have put in place a mechanism which in principle should enable surgeons to develop expertise in the treatment of Neopatellar syndrome in a specialist area and that that ought to develop uh, much better outcomes, so as time goes by, the outcomes will be greater. I would, my, my hope and my wish is that this could grow and that when the European Directive comes into force, because I don't think there'll be enough workload for many of these areas, and I wouldn't be in the slightest bit surprised if it's one centre for Europe. And I think being, being close to London, and being close to international airports, it might well be that that is the place for Europe. So I'm, I honestly believe it could have, you know, a major effect going forward. But 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 now it's up to us to make that work if we if we choose to. Any other questions? Can I yeah? just say thank you on behalf of all of us here and on all the efforts that you and Kat have actually put in to actually get that into place because um, obviously we've been totally um, in the dark about all the background work you've put in so far. So can we all say a big round of applause to you? Yeah. Thank you very much.